Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What a mighty God we serve. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Father, I decrease that the Holy Spirit might increase. Speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind. Father, your word is anointed. It shall never return to you void. And it will accomplish everything that you send it out to do. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. It is in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. Our subject today is simple. It is prophetic. It is saying the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. You will recall that the people in our text had been exiles in Babylon. After 70 years, God moved on their captivity and allowed that king of the Medes to set them free and send them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple of God. They came because they heard the call of Zerubbabel and Joshua to come and serve the Lord in the city of their ancestors. But all the Jews did not come. Not many of the wealthy were willing to leave their places of affluence and status in the city of Babylon to go to a deserted, destroyed, destitute city. Yet this was the city of Jerusalem, the place where the name of the Lord dwelt. This was the place of the great temple of King Solomon, where they would ascend each Sabbath day, singing the songs of ascent, which are in your Bible, in those Psalms, Psalms 124, through Psalms about 148. They would just pick one of those Psalms uh, in, from the book of Psalms and sing as they walked up to the temple because the temple was seated in a high place. and They had to look up to get there. And when they would look up, they would sing the hymn, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hill from whence cometh my help, for my help cometh from the Lord they would be singing and they would be saying with David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. They had a choir singing behind them. They had uh, musicians playing with the choir. 
It was a grand affair when they would ascend to the house of the Lord. People were happy. People were glad because they were coming to give praise and thanks and glory to their God for all that he had done. It was a wonderful occasion. You can see the children coming up the hill with their parents. You can see the elderly walking with their generations. Everybody singing the songs of, a, of ascent. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. They always have something to praise God for. Lord have mercy, it was a holy time. It was a grateful time. They would go in unison to worship and praise the Lord. What a glorious time it must have been. What a glorious heritage. We must have been bequeathed here at Lewis Temple when the faculty at Gramlin were here and the people in the community were here and children were spread throughout the sanctuary and children were being taught the word of God and laughter was heard in the sanctuary. Laughter was heard in the fellowship hall and even when struggles came, they would still come to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because worship was essential. They praised God. Singers were birthed in this church. Musicians were birthed in this church. Lecturers were birthed in this church. People were blessed. The students were blessed. They had a place to call home. They had a place to worship God. Oh, it was a high time in Lewis Temple. They would praise God with happy hearts. And God says, who was here in those days? Who remembers the high times in the temple in Jerusalem, and the high times in the church named Lewis Temple? Who remembers the faces of those who were seated in the sanctuary? Who sits in the sanctuary and can envision Coach Cole sitting there can envision Dr. Caper sitting there? Can envision Charles Young sitting there? Who in the church remembers when the house of God was full and vibrant and everything was in order and the name of the Lord God was praised? And God turns the table and says, how do it, it look now? <laughs> God asked the question to the people, whoever was here back then, how does your church look today? How do you speak about your church? How do you view your church? What is your perspective about your church? Have you become despondent? Yearning for a day that's already passed. How do you, he says, how do you see it now? So a group of people decided we're going back home. We're going to reestablish worship. We're going to Jerusalem no matter what. God sent Zerubbabel there, or the king of the Medes sent Zerubbabel there to establish the city, to build up the city. And Joshua was sent to restore the temple the worship of God and, and all the people that were in the, the, the pilgrimage were longing, looking forward to seeing the glory of God in the land of their fathers. That's what college homecoming is about. That's what family reunions are about. People coming together so they can reminisce and they can remember the days of yore, the days when families were great and when things were simple in life and when everything was a blessing, they come. They look forward to it. They remembered the stories as they walked, they would share their stories. You remember when Big Mama told us not to go in the choir and we went in a way and Big Mama came in the choir, snatched us by our ears and got us to go back and sit down because it wasn't our Sunday to sing. You remember when Big Mama told us don't eat out of that plate. No, you eat out of this plate. You remember when Big Mama would slip you a quarter 
tell you put it in church. You remember the good times of your youth when church was a central place in your life. They told those stories as they journeyed back to Jerusalem. They remember the stories of Moses. They remember the stories of Aaron. They remember the stories of all of the prophets and all that Israel had been through. They remembered their God. They were excited. When they arrived, they got to work immediately. They got to work because joy filled the city of Jerusalem once again. For 16 years, the children of God worked diligently and faithfully to complete the project of rebuilding the city and rebuilding the temple. But after 16 years working on this project, it looked like there was no end in sight. The children of Israel got weary. They got discouraged. The obstacles and pains they endured began to take its toll and the rebuilding effort had become a daunting task. They would say things like, we ain't got no money. We can't do this. I'm tired of this. I've worked my fingers to the bone, to the bone but I don't see any results. I think I'm gonna go home. I think I'm going home. I'm working my house. I'm gonna take care of my business. I'm not gonna worry about God's house. I'm not gonna worry about this city. Enough is enough. I'm going home. Their inclination was to faint, give up, and quit. They did make some progress. They did repair some of the walls of the temple, laid a new foundation, and built a temporary altar for the worship of God. But then they had challenges because their enemies showed up. You remember the Samaritans, that mixed group that had formed the community when the children of Israel were taken captive. The poor, the outcast, the left out that remained in the city, married people from other nationalities, created this uh, mixed breed community called Samaritans. Well, they were not happy to see them come home. They were not happy to see the people of God rebuilding the city and the temple. They got this new king named Ahasuerus to stop them from building the temple. That's just like Satan. When things are going well, he tries to sow seeds of discord just to get you to stop. People argue about any and everything. Whatever's available to fuss about. Whatever's available to argue about. That's what happens when you're discouraged. That's what happens when your spirit is weak and your faith is faltering. When this happened, they decided we got to quit. They turned to their own private affairs and gradually got used to worshiping in that temporary altar among the ruins. They decided, well, we got a temporary altar. We got a half made church. We do have walls and we got an altar. So we're going to get used to just worshiping in mess. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. They decided we're not going to be concerned about the, the cleanliness. We're not going to be concerned about the appearance. We're not going to be concerned about whether uh, God's house is completed. We're just going to leave it like it is. We're going to come here on the Sabbath and worship among mess. If it's dirty, oh well. If it's filthy, oh well. If it needs to be clean, oh well. We're, we're tired, we've been working for 16 years and we got all these enemies on our track. We don't seem to have the resources we need and we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So we're going home. That's exactly what they did. After 16 years, they were neglecting the temple. They had set aside their own spiritual priorities. They had turned to doing what was pleasing in their own eyes. They had forgotten about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God was not pleased with their misplaced priorities. They were living for themselves. 
and not for the glory of God. They were living their best life. God knew. God knew that they were seriously off course. Something had to change. And so God, had, who had begun this good work in them, wanted them to finish and complete it on his behalf. God had a brighter future for the generations to come. God had a greater destiny for their children and their children's children. So God called leaders to undertake a plan that would make the temple greater than it had ever been. God called Joshua. God called the people together and said, greater is coming. You got to work like greater is coming. You've got to think like greater is coming. You've got to believe that greater is coming. You've got to change the way you speak and change the way you think and know that all things are possible to them that believe that God's hand is not short, that it cannot heal. Neither is his ear, ear heavy that he cannot hear. But whatever you need, when you call on the name of Jesus, God will supply. Oh, I'm feeling this thing. Amen, amen, amen. God said enough is enough too. God said I'm sick and tired of being ignored. I'm sick and tired of folk going home on me. Thinking that the house of God is unimportant. Thinking that they can do any and everything they want to do. God set about to restore order and to give the people the impetus to work and to be strong and to do what needed to be done. Lord have mercy. And guess who God called? It was at this point that God called a 75 year old prophet who stepped up with a word from the Lord. This prophet was not a stranger to the people. He too was in captivity. He had been born in captivity, lived among the people, attended Sabbath services and watched the work of God go forth boldly for 16 years. His name was Haggai. He had sat where they sat and lived as they lived. He had watched the decline of the work of God and its effect upon the lives of the people People's lives had been dealt a very difficult blow. Haggai brought a word designed to restate the value and significance of what the people had begun to do for the Lord. He brought a word of encouragement in the form of a challenge. Haggai challenged the people in chapter 1. Verse 5, he said to the people, consider your ways. Reconsider your reason for not completing the Lord's work. Haggai had prayed and sought the Lord about their situation, and God gave him a word. God gave him the challenge to give to the people, and he opened his mouth, and he spoke told them to compare their personal lives before and after they had ceased working on the Lord's vision. He said, take inventory of the blessings you were receiving when God's house was in order and take an inventory of how the blessings changed when you neglected the house of God. In other words, Haggai said, it's real. God is real. God's blessings are real, but when you neglect and turn from making God a priority, your life is never the same. You are never the same. God insists that God will not share God's glory with anybody else. Now let's just envision God come and take inventory here. God comes to Lewis Temple this morning and Begins from the back four year and look around and walk through this church. What would he see? My, my, my. If I see it, I know God sees it. 
And I know you see it. But what would God say about the temple? Lewis Temple with the water box that signal trouble with the fellowship hall that needs to be refurbished, renovated, and redone. What would God say to the church, the Lewis Temple Church? Because there is no technology, there is no way to communicate with the outside world. What would God say about us? as we worship among the ruins of a great heritage. What would God say about us as he purviewed this church? Would God challenge us as Haggai challenged them? Would God come this morning and say, who is left among you that saw this house in its first glow? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Would our ancestors come to church and have the church quite like this? Would this be their standard? Would they be getting together to make sure the church is not only pristine, but to make sure it represents and exemplifies the God they worship and the God they serve? You remember the days of yore when one would volunteer to pay for this and another would volunteer to pay for that and all the monies would get together and the things would just appear in the church and the church would have the things that it needed and the people that the church served would come in and be blessed. What a great time that must have been. And God wanted the leaders and the remaining elderly people to know that he had a new vision for a new generation. Some of them had lived back in the day when things were well and the temple worship was vibrant and the spirit of God moved people to great heights in worship. Those older people could remember when Solomon's temple was first built and they wanted Zerubbabel and Joshua to rebuild the temple in the same way with the same spirit of excellence. They were also resistant to change of any kind. And they heard about all the new things the Rubabel and Joshua had in mind. They felt that they were being disrespected and that their generation was being dishonored. But God told them to compare the end from the beginning. They were not trying to duplicate Solomon's temple. They were trying to do a new thing based on the resources that God had provided. And the older generation said, no, that ain't how we do it. That ain't, that don't go there. You got that in the wrong place. You got the move. Now put it back, put it back, put it back. Y'all remember, the old stewardesses will tell you, put it back in a minute. The ushers at the door will tell you, no, you ain't coming in here with that. People were, 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 were enamored with God and they wanted God to have the best from us. They didn't want us to just come to Lewis Temple and languish and not have a spirit, not have emotion, not have joy. They wanted us to not only be in God's presence, but to feel God's presence. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Yes, that Temple of Solomon was glorious, but that temple had not stopped the, them and it had not stopped God from disciplining them because though they had that marvelous temple that everybody worshiped as they were coming up to it, they were not dedicated and committed to God. They would leave the temple and engage in things that God had disallowed. So when you do that, you begin to lose your vibrancy. You begin to lose your spirit before long, you're just coming and sitting, and sitting and coming. Going through the motions, looking at your watch, hoping this thing is over soon because you got something next on your mind. But when the spirit of the Lord is present, when the spirit of the Lord enters the room, he focuses you 
on God and the blessings of God. God said, remember the temple of Solomon. Look around you, see the devastation, destruction and despair of that generation who venerated the temple rather than the most high God. People fell in love with the building, not in love with the maker of the universe. They were having high church as they worshiped the temple. God knew the older generation saw the ruins and rubble and yearn for days gone by, they were being nostalgic. They saw their ancestors' dreams. They, they saw their hopes being dashed and destroyed. They remembered the past with fondness and were paralyzed to enter into the future. When they looked at the temple, all they could see were crushed dreams. The hearts were broken. They dreamed of the day when the temple would be built just like it was before they were taken away captive. They were telling Zerubbabel and Joshua to make it like it was. You know that song. Make it like it was. We sing it all the time, but I guarantee you it'll never be what it was again. You'll never have that experience you had before again because your experiences not only with God, but in life should get better and better. You should go higher and higher in the worship of God. You, you're not a dope fiend that you got to get a hit every five minutes to feel like you felt. No, you are a child of the living God. That spirit goes with you wherever you go. You can get happy in the mall. You can get happy in your car. You can get happy at the grocery store. You can have the joy of the Lord in your heart and you can feel and experience God in a different way every time. You know, they told the story about the seraphim and the cherubim. When they were writing that psalm, they would say, holy, holy, holy. They would bow down. And they say every time they looked up, God was doing something new. So they went right back to holy, holy, holy. They bowed down. They looked up. God was doing something new. So they did. They couldn't do nothing but praise God because they could not control nor contain the blessings of God with one holy, holy, holy. Every time I turn around, God is doing something new. And because God is doing a new thing, and I want to be in God's presence with a new thing, my praise has to go to another level. I must open my heart up to praise God in a different way doing different things, pleasing God in the new thing that God presents to me so that my joy will not falter. And so God says to them, my spirit is with you. That's, that's what he said. He said, tell them my spirit is with them, not the ancestors. The ancestors are not going to come back and do the work. My spirit is with you because you are here, because you remain, because you have come. My spirit is moving you. So get with the program. Get excited about the work that is presented before you. And if you get excited, then the best is yet to come. Lord have mercy. I believe that the best is yet to come. I'm like Dr. King, I might not be here with you when it comes, but I believe it's coming. I believe, Lewis Temple, that the Spirit of God is here. One reason, because I'm here and I know the Spirit of God is with me. Another reason, because I have encountered the Spirit of God upon you. And so I know that the Spirit of God is with us and God says in his word, be strong. You can't do this work being weak. You can't do this work whining and complaining. You've got to challenge the challenges that come to you. Trouble your troubles. Be strong. Open your mouth and declare, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We're going to work until it is completed. We're going to be strong. We're not going to be afraid. We're going to dig our hands in the dirt. We're going to put our hearts to the plow, and we're going to rebuild the clean pristine 
appearance of God's house. We're going to worship God in new ways. We're going to allow God to engage us, especially in our mind. For the Bible does not say be transformed by the renewing of your dance. He doesn't say learn a new dance. There's a lot of new dances coming in the world now. But God says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God says what you need is education in my word, in my intention for you. You need to hear ye the word of the Lord and allow it to become a part of you. That's why I read the scripture and I put Lewis Temple and Earl Griffin in the scripture. See yourself in this scripture. See God speaking to you this morning, saying my spirit is with you. I'm not the God of just the past. I'm the God of the now. Same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. God is with us. He's living among us. And he wants to do great and mighty things. He has not changed his mind concerning you. He knows the thoughts he has toward you. Thoughts of good and not evil. He wants us to be thankful. He wants us to be renewed. He wants us to lift up holy hands and give him praise and stay on the wall and do the work that God has assigned. So that's why I'm here this morning. My time is up. I'm here this morning to remind us that if we follow God's vision, our future will be better than it's ever been. This temple still has a role to play in the lives of people in this city and around Lincoln Parish, around the world indeed. God has done great things for us. Well, I'm glad, but better is coming. The best is yet to come. We're on our way to God's next level of glory. And if we are faithful, eyes have not seen nor ears heard what good things the Lord has in store for us. Be strong, be encouraged in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet? We sing our invitation of him that at cross, uh, okay, at the cross, last it did my savior bleed. Did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head to such a worm as I? Let us sing to